Let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Stubble McShave, who writes, I saw in the Hollywood Reporter that the Cassian Andor series had added some cast members and that Tony Gilroy had taken over as showrunner. Do you think that the change from Stephen, uh, Stephen Schiff to Tony Gilroy is a normal thing or is it another sign of poorly vetted people by Lucasfilm? All right. Thanks a lot for sending this in, man. And yes, we've been waiting on this Cassian Andor show. I mean, they were even talking about it. They brought the cast out and everything, even all the way back at D23. Not a lot of stuff has come out since then. But now we're hearing about some shuffling. Now, this is the actual report that came out about this. This comes to us from The Hollywood Reporter that writes, While there is no start date for production, the series, Cassian Andor, has undergone some creative shifts. The Hollywood Reporter has learned that Tony Gilroy, who co-wrote Rogue One, is now show running the series with Stephen Schiff exiting that post. Gilroy was already part of a writing team that included brother Dan Gilroy, who did Nightcrawler, Bo uh, Williman, who did House of Cards, and the aforementioned Stephen Schiff. Tony Gilroy will also direct the pilot and possibly a second episode, but like Disney Plus's other Star Wars show, The Mandalorian, the goal is to have a stable of directors. All right, thanks uh, to Hollywood Reporter for that. Now, I got to say, here's, here's the first thought that comes across my mind, and I'll get this out of the way first. And I, I don't like harping on stuff, but when it comes up again, it's got to be mentioned again. In the world of film and television, it is not a outrageously rare thing that a director changes. It's not an outrageously thing in Hollywood. It is not an outrageously thing, an outrageously rare thing in the world of Hollywood television that a show director gets changed. That's not an outrageously rare thing either. What continues to absolutely amaze me is that under the stewardship of Kathleen Kennedy, who, when her career is all said and done, I will stand and applaud her career. She is one of the greatest producers in the history of Hollywood. However, her track record at Lucasfilm, when it comes to the number one responsibility she has, which is to properly interview, properly vet, and make the best decisions on putting the right directors or showrunners in place for their projects. While it is not an incredibly rare thing that a movie or a TV show will change a director or a showrunner, I have never seen, Rob, in one studio under one person with the limited amount of projects we've had in the Star Wars films and what we've seen on TV, this much turnover in either the showrunner's chair or more applicably, the director's chair. And so when I opened up the news and I read the person, so the person they appointed a showrunner, guess what? They're gone. And I just thought, eh, yeah, yeah, it's business as usual over there. To me, it is a, a symptom of absolute chaos, of absolute chaos. And you can only get away with that for so long. And nobody else is making a big deal out of this. Everybody wants to talk about the fact that we've got... Um, uh, the, the the woman, um, Genevieve, and I'm forgetting her, her O'Reilly, coming back to play Mon Mothma. That's great. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But again, to me, I just look at this and go, what? Again? 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 It's not a rare thing, but when you've had about eight projects now and seven director or showrunner turnover controversies, this is... This screams to me that while Kathleen Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy, who I am a fan of, is, again, as Steven Spielberg calls her, maybe the most talented producer that's ever done it in the history of Hollywood, this thing about taking this position is not a great fit for her. And it just kind of screams that again, and it's unfortunate. Okay, let's get past that now, Rob, and let's talk about the idea that we've got Tony Gilroy coming in. Who, who did do a good job with it. I love Rogue One. I think Rogue One is probably the second best Disney era Star Wars film. I love that movie. Um, decent choice to put into the chair. Also, of course, the the mentions, I mentioned earlier, they've brought in two new actresses. The one of note is Genevieve O'Reilly, who is coming back to play Mon Mothma. Of course, she played Mon Mothma in uh, Star Wars Rogue One. It's kind of cool to see that the character is coming back and that they're bringing her back as well. So that's all cool. Rob, you take a look at this entire situation 
from Tony Geroy taking over the showrunner chair, the bringing in of the actress who played Ma Mothma again, just the fact that Cassie and Andor still looks like it has life in it, which is good news. But anyway, Rob, you take a look at this. What do you think? I have a theory. I have ah, a theory. I have ah. a theory. I have a theory about, and th this this latest news is something that it solidified something for me. Like as you know, even on my own YouTube show, I've talked a lot about my admiration for Kathleen Kennedy. I don't think this is her fault. I think there is a fundamental problem that Disney has as a company with Star Wars, and I think. The very problem is Star Wars is about war. It is about a galactic conflict between the forces of good and evil. And when you start doing a show like a Cassian Andor series, even The Mandalorian, I mean, if you think about it, if you remove Baby Yoda from The Mandalor or, or The Child out of The Mandalorian, it, it's pretty bleak. I mean, there's there's a lot of of I, I mean, we're we're the galaxy is in turmoil. People are dying, and I really think that as creators start delving into the actual situation in uh, the galaxy far, far away, that you run into a problem with Disney's corporate interests and about the kind of entertainment. You know, from the studio that's bringing you Pixar movies like Finding Nemo and Wall-E, or if you're going to watch Tangled or Frozen, how do you make a show about a galaxy-wide conflict where in every episode people are dying and you're watching an underground rebellion movement? I mean, if you look at the beginning of Rogue One, Cassian Andor straight up has to let some dude get killed in cold blood so he doesn't get captured himself. And I think that the Disney corporate structure, when they start, even if Bob Iger or whoever is above Kathleen Kennedy, their legal department has to vet and approve these scripts. I think that they have a real problem. They thought, ooh, Star Wars, it's for kids. But there was never anybody really stopping to think, wait a minute, there's a lot of really dark, really um, – bad stuff in these movies that are in diametric opposition to what Disney as a brand name is. And if you want to make effective Star Wars underneath the Disney umbrella, and you're it's called Star Wars, not Star Conflict or Star Moderation or Star or Mediation. It's Star Wars and people die in war and people die horribly and uh, war is, is is shades of gray and it's not just black and white. Here are the evil guys in the black masks breathing heavy and here are the squeaky good clean fighters of the resistance. And the more you get into these shows and with audiences demanding what they're demanding today, which is sophisticated looks at this conflict, we don't want to look at these things as if we're five years old. Star Wars fans are very sophisticated. Uh, entertainment is very sophisticated. And I think that they've got a real problem. You know, if they're going to announce a female centric show, I think that part of the reason they're doing that is not because of an agenda, but because they think, oh, if we have a female led martial arts series, maybe it's not as dark as, say, a Cassie and Andor series when you can't help but delve into these dark issues, dark concepts. I mean, they get away with it on Clone Wars because it's animated. But I think they've got a real problem See, that I they don't know can't that I agree. I don't know that I agree. And the reason why I don't know that I agree is because when you look, because if that was the case, then that would be something that would spill over into all the properties that they control. But if you go and look at something like the MCU at Marvel, where you having an intergalactic tyrant literally killing half the, the, the life in the universe, when you have Agent Phil Coulson getting stabbed through the chest with this giant scepter spear when you're having you know vision getting his head ripped out and all this kind of stuff there's a when you have you know the all father dying when you have thor having losing an eye when you have his whole home world being destroyed i mean it seems but, to me that disney isn't shy terribly shy about delving into heavier stuff like we got in rogue one and things like that Right. I, but, I don't think I don't think the I think the problem really does come from 
from the fact well and, and again none of that addresses the the idea about how are they losing all of these directors and showrunners and and i think that's got to go right back just like the buck stops with kevin feige when it comes to his directors and whatever he's going to do with his showrunners on his disney plus shows i think the buck stops there with kathleen kennedy um, and I don't know if it's an issue of that because they do do a lot of heavier things. But but you well, see you see that a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, look, when you're dealing with comic book characters, you've still got a giant ball sack chinned pink, purple tyrant wielding. Uh, I mean, superhero movies are, have an inherent brightness to them that tempers. Yeah, but, yeah, your but he skin. also held up Loki by one hand and snapped his neck with his fist, of right? Of course, but I mean, it's still, uh, it's like, you know, you don't get, when you watch a Roadrunner cartoon and Wile E. Coyote gets blown up and thrown off a mountain and all that, kids can watch that because they understand that it's inherently, th there's a tone there that's different. But Star, Star Wars is ultimately about, you know, our very human characters in a dark a relatively dark universe and i just think it's a tonal issue and when they bring on these these directors and showrunners i think the showrunners are like okay we're doing a we're doing a show about a galactic rebellion in 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 Cassian Andor or Rogue One whatever they're going to call it and we're going to deal with the nuanced levels of this kind of behavior what would really go on in this situation they're calling it a spy and, thriller too like uh, like yeah, an espionage wartime spy thriller Right, yeah, which is really cool. But when you start dealing with the wartime spy thriller, think about that. How do you make that appeal to eight-year-olds? And I think that is inherently the problem, whereas kids grow up with superheroes, so they know. And they've grown up with Star Wars, but when you – they've grown up with Luke and Leia and, and Rey and Kylo Ren. But when you're dealing with a spy thriller, suddenly you're thrust into a more adult milieu that I think that suddenly – they're asking themselves, well, wait a minute, are the eight-year-olds going to get what's going on? But doesn't are they that ultimately, understand? isn't that ultimately still then Kathleen Kennedy's responsibility to understand what is it we can do as Lucasfilm and then properly meet with directors and showrunners to make sure that they are on the same page with her, she is on the same page with them, she is the main head of Lucasfilm. It's her job to no, make I sure that she understands the corporate interests and that she passes on the expectations to whatever the showrunners or directors are. And the fact is that time and time, and again, it pains me to say this because I am a fan of Kathleen Kennedy, but time and time, I've been saying this for two years, for time and time and time and time and time again, we have seen her drop the ball on this, that she doesn't communicate properly to those that she's putting in positions of responsibility. She doesn't properly vet the people she's putting in position of responsibility. She doesn't listen to the actual visions of the people in responsibility because then a few weeks later, she's like, oh, wait a minute, that's your vision? Well, I can't have that. Well, why didn't you know that a month ago? I, I mean, that's the point. So I, I think there's truth in what you're saying, but I yeah. just think that that river of truth that flows forth from Robert Meyer Burnett flows through the channel of Kathleen <laughs> Kennedy, who has to be the gatekeeper of that. And 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 it just, I again, I just think, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a fairly intelligent guy, but guess what? Don't make, make don't make me the head of the brain surgery department at the local hospital. That's not right. my area. I just feel like this isn't the right job for her. But I I don't know. But Rob, listen, I've I've been focusing us on the negative stuff here. But what about the positives here? We got Tony Gilroy stepping in to be the showrunner. That's an interesting thing. We've got the uh, the Mon Mothma actress come back. What do you make of that? Those uh, events. Well, no, I think that's great. I, I love that. I've always loved the character of Mon Mothma since we first saw her in Jedi. I think she's she's really good, and I like the fact that they brought her back and the continuity. Whenever they can work in that kind of continuity with an actor or something with the rest of the franchise, I've always enjoyed that. Uh, and by the way, of all the new Star Wars shows, because Rogue One is like you, I think it's my favorite of. It really is my favorite of the Disney era movies, even though it's not without its flaws. But I really do like the film. I think this the idea behind this show is a really good idea. I really like this idea, and um, I, 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 Tony Gilroy is a very talented creator and a talented writer, and I'm very excited about that. And I uh, I think that th that's good news. I'm just I just wonder if it's possible. And like you, like you, like I agree, Kathleen Kennedy should know 
dealing with what she's been dealing with. But I think probably in her mind, every time she starts into one of these things, she's like, maybe this time it'll be different because it has to be. Eventually, Disney must relent and and understand what it is that we're dealing with here. But unfortunately, that doesn't quite seem to be the case. But I do see the fact that this show is going forward at all exciting because I was really excited about this show. Yeah, I, agree. I, I hope I hope it's great. I really like the movie that it came from. I like the Cassie and Andor character. Um, and I I want to see more of how the rebellion is put together. And, and I look forward to seeing all the, you know, those bit characters like Gold Leader, you know, coming back. Um, and if they bring those guys back, I mean, they obviously can't use the footage. But the characters of 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 those, I, I, I'm excited to see this show. You know what? And, I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that the two projects that have had relatively the least amount of pre-production behind the scenes drama, uh, at least to me, I, I know you won't agree with this order, but I think you'll see where I'm going with this. Mandalorian and the first film, Force Awakens. Uh, to, from, from my perspective, at any rate, I, th- I don't think it's a coincidence that those two things where there was absolutely no drama, director drama, showrunner drama, whatever. Kathleen Kennedy put in J.J. Abrams on that first one, no drama. She put in Jon Favreau on Mandalorian, no drama. To me, it's not a coincidence that those end up being maybe the best examples uh, of Star Wars coming out of the Disney era, the ones without any drama. So it's going to be interesting to see where, where things go moving forward. So... Always the eternal optimist, Robert. Always the eternal optimist. All right, guys. Question is, what do you make of these little changes? What do you think about the return of Mon Mothma to the show? What do you think about the very fact that it sounds like they're moving forward? Jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right.